This brings us to our next reactions. Adding PBr3, PCl3, or SOCL2 to alcohols. Now I, I acknowledge that the two reactions I've shown you thus far, reacting an alcohol or an ether with HX, does produce an alkyl halide, either an alkyl chloride, an alkyl bromide, or an alkyl iodide. However, there are better, much smoother, and more efficient ways of turning alcohols into alkyl chlorides and bromides. One of them is this. If I take an alcohol, such as this cyclopentanol shown here, and treat it with this reagent called thionyl chloride, which I often just call SOCL2. And usually I don't say SOCL2. I actually say SOCL2 like I'm howling at the moon, because it makes it more exciting. What happens is this OH gets replaced with a chlorine, giving me an alkyl chloride. This is a very efficient way to convert an alcohol directly into an alkyl chloride. Similarly, you can treat an alcohol, such as this example molecule shown here, with this reagent, PBr3, and replace the OH with a bromine, giving us an alkyl bromide. Now, one thing that I want to stress is this. PBr3 can be replaced with PCl3, phosphorus trichloride, if you want to replace the OH with a chlorine instead of a bromine. What's the take home from this slide? Well, if you want to convert an alcohol into an alkyl chloride, you can, instead of reacting with hydrochloric acid, react it with SOCL2 or PCl3. Similarly, if you want to convert an alcohol into an alkyl bromide, you can react it with PBr3. So here are the mechanisms of those reactions, which I do not require you to know and I'm not going to go through. I am going to show them to you just in case you want to look at them. In the case of PBr3, the alcohol's lone pair goes into the phosphorus, kicks off a bromide, and gives us this intermediate. This molecule right here, which is called pyridine, strips that proton to give me this intermediate. And then an attacking bromide displaces it to give me my final product. With SOCL2, which looks like this, the oxygen undergoes this type of reaction mechanism. Once again, pyridine, the six-membered ring that has a nitrogen, is involved. Now we move to our next reaction, converting alcohols to sulfonate esters. What is a sulfonate ester? Well, don't worry, I'll show you. Here's the overall reaction. If I've got an alcohol and I treat it with a molecule that looks like this. Now look at this molecule closely. This is a sulfur double bonded to two oxygens, also single bonded to chlorine, and then some kind of hydrocarbon group. I also add pyridine as a base. It ends up replacing this hydrogen with this sulfur double bonded to the oxygens and single bonded to this alkyl group. I hope you can look at that closely and see what's actually happening. This type of product is called a sulfonate ester. Now I realize at this point you might be wondering why in the world would I ever want to make a sulfonate ester? Although I'm going to show that to you in greater detail later on, I will summarize it right now by just saying this. This reaction is useful because a sulfonate group is a much better leaving group than an OH. In other words, if I want to convert an OH into a better leaving group, I can react it with sulfonyl chloride. Once again, I'll show you a more specific example of this further on. Here's the mechanism of this transformation, which once again, I don't require you to know, but I'm going to show you just in case you are interested. The oxygen lone pair electrons come out, form a bond with the sulfur, kick off the chloride, and give me this intermediate. The pyridine base strips this proton and pumps these electrons into the positively charged oxygen to neutralize it, giving me my sulfonate ester product. One thing I want you to note about this slide is the following. This R prime group is drawn to be generic, but it actually can represent different groups and thus different types of sulfonate esters. Here are the three different kinds of sulfonate esters that we will care about in this class. If this R group is a benzene ring bonded to a methyl group, we call this paratoluene sulfonyl chloride, or sometimes just tosyl chloride, or TS chloride. This type of group in which the R prime is just a methyl is called methane sulfonyl chloride, or sometimes just mesyl chloride. And this last group in which my R prime is a trifluoromethyl group is called trifluoromethane sulfonyl chloride, or sometimes just trifluyl chloride. Once again, I don't care if you know the structures of these with too much detail. What I do care about is that you know why they're used, which I'll show you right now. Sulfonate esters, as I mentioned before, are good leaving groups, so they can easily do this. 
if I've got an oxygen that presumably was formerly an OH and has been converted into a sulfonate ester, it can easily be kicked off by a nucleophile that normally couldn't kick off an OH. This is one example of an S minus coming in and kicking off this sulfonate group to form this product right here. Here's another example. I've got my sulfonate ester right here, in this case a tosylate group, and I've got a cyanide nucleophile coming in here to kick off this oxygen. I guarantee that if I tried to do either of these two reactions with just a regular OH as opposed to an OTS, it would be much more difficult and maybe wouldn't even go at all. That brings us to this example from my class problem set. Draw the products of each of the following reactions. Now in this case I've only shown one. I've got OH reacting with tosyl chloride and pyridine in step one, and then I'm treating it with cyanide nucleophile in step two. What in the world does this sequence do? Well remember, what occurs is this oxygen reacts with the tosyl chloride to replace the hydrogen with a tosyl group. In other words, I will have, after step one, an OTS here. An OTS is a very, very good leaving group. That means that in step two, the cyanide can come in here, the carbon minus forms a bond with this carbon right here, and kicks off the OTS in one fell swoop, SN2 style, to give me this product. You'll note that there is an inversion of stereochemistry right here because the cyanide has to come in from the backside relative to where the OTS was. All right, we're going to end this lecture right here, but don't worry, we'll go on teaching you about more wonderful substitution and elimination reactions. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.